Some of you might remember this mid-century style dresser that I did about a year ago. It was covered in paint and after a lot of hard work and some TLC, I was able to bring this back to the beautiful walnut veneer that was underneath all that paint. I mentioned in that video that there was actually another piece that came with it that I wasn't sure if I should buy it and I ended up buying both, but this one has been in storage since then and I'm finally ready to tackle it. These pieces were made in the 1960s, late 1960s, by a Canadian company. They are a walnut wood grain over pressed wood, which is almost always what mid-century furniture is made of. There's a strange misconception that most mid-century furniture is solid wood. It is not. Actually, a fairly small portion of it is solid wood. But veneer is wood, and I'm going to do my best to bring back the beauty of this piece. Stay tuned. My name is Angie and I refinish furniture. Sometimes I paint and sometimes I don't, but I always do what I can to save old pieces from the trash. Welcome to my workroom. It's always great when pieces still have a maker's mark and stickers. This one actually shows the date it was made. So going back to the pressed wood thing, this isn't entirely pressed wood. We have a solid wood frame, solid wood legs, solid wood handle pieces, and the drawers are a mix of solid wood, plywood, and veneers. The top and sides are pressed wood sandwiched by two pieces of veneer. Hold that thought for two seconds while I explain what's happening here. This top drawer is not going in or out very easily and a quick inspection shows me that the guide is fine, the little rail is fine, everything is tight, there's no reason this should be sticking. So I'm opting to switch the drawers around. Most of the time when I'm buying a piece of furniture that's advertised as having sticky drawers, especially this style of furniture, they're in the wrong spots and you can see the maker's mark is supposed to be in the top drawer and I just switched these around and now both of these drawers work totally fine. So back to what I was saying. The easiest way to tell when you're looking at a piece if it is this pressed wood material is to have a look at the underside of it because that is where you will see it exposed. Sometimes you can see it on the back panel but not always. This does not make a piece of furniture crap <laughs> and I'm trying my best to dispel that myth that these pieces are junk. They are not junk. They have survived right alongside all of the solid wood pieces, sometimes even outliving solid wood pieces or in better condition than solid wood pieces. In fact, a lot of people with mid-century furniture swear up and down their pieces are solid wood and they're not. And it just happens to be what was happening in manufacturing and furniture at the time. But a lot of these pieces have beautiful walnut, teak, and mahogany veneers on the outside and it allowed manufacturers to give you these beautiful to look at pieces while doing it more sustainably. You can get a lot more pieces out of a log if you make veneer versus solid wood and these pieces are less prone to warping and cracking like solid wood is. I will often have people comment saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe they painted that beautiful wood. But a lot of people assume it's solid wood and it's not. And quite often those same people are the ones that shun or stick their nose up at composite pieces and there's no need to. They're structurally sound and beautiful to look at. I don't really understand what the problem is. As you can see, this scraper is very, very easily taking this paint off. Now you might be wondering why I'm not using a chemical stripper, and it's actually one of the questions I get asked the most when it comes to removing a finish. And that is how I decide between using a chemical stripper, sanding a finish off, or scraping like I'm doing here. I'm actually gonna be doing both on this piece. I'm opting to use my scraper to remove the paint because it is a latex paint. They did not prime or scuff sand the surface prior to applying it. I can literally peel this off with my fingers if I wanted to. Using a chemical stripper on paint that is coming off this easily would just make a mess. And if you've ever tried to remove white paint from walnut wood grain, you know that it is a nightmare. So the last thing I wanna do is introduce liquid white paint to this wood grain. So I'm trying to remove as much of the paint as I can first, and then I'm gonna use a stripper on the original finish, which does need some attention. 
The exception to this is the legs. Now the legs are a different type of wood. They're not walnut and the frame itself is not walnut. The leg assembly and the frame is actually ash and it's solid wood. So I'm going to be using a stripper on the paint there. But yeah, I really don't like using a chemical stripper on white paint on a dark wood just because it ends up in the wood grain and I can't stand it. <laughs> So looking here at these rails, you can see that the wood underneath appears to be dark, but it's not. It is a tinted lacquer that they put on to make it more closely match the walnut veneer on the outside. It is actually ash, which is a naturally light colored wood. So in order to get these to match the veneer, because I'm taking this all back to wood grain, I'm going to have to stain it. But first, I need to get all this off. Because more than half of what I deal with is mid-century, I see a lot of legs and leg assembly and many times they're just basic like screw in, like you can see the back one there just screws in. I actually love this particular leg assembly and I've seen it several times. They actually have it mortised together here and it just gives it so much more strength and having that vertical board underneath will help prevent the middle from sagging a bit. I wish that some of the longer dressers had that as well, especially those big six foot ones because they do have a tendency to sag or dip in the middle over time. Now, even though this is the underside and will never be seen, I hate leaving paint there. So I usually try to get off what I can. I'm not as particular about it because it'll never be seen. This is actually a really good shot of the assembly here. You can see that the frame itself is wood, but if you look on the edge where the side panel is, you can see that press wood that I was talking about earlier. And that is sandwiched in between two pieces of veneer. I'm using some 120 grit sandpaper here to clean this up. Now this part is optional, but if you've seen some of my other videos, you know that I do like to do this sometimes on the bottoms. This has some original fingerprints from the manufacturer, which is kind of funny, but <laughs> I am actually going to remove that and just clean this up a little bit. Obviously with this material, you can't really sand it down, but you can smooth it out and just make it look a little bit fresher. I'm using that same 120 grit on the solid wood portions of the frame here, and I used a 150 grit on the veneer itself. There are lots of little corners full of paint, so I have this specialty teardrop shaped scraper to try to peel as much of that out as I can. One thing to realize when you're working on pieces like this is you'll never get every single drop of paint out, but obviously you want to try to get as much as possible. Mm -hmm. 
So it's time now to move on to removing the original finish, which is lacquer in most cases on these mid-century pieces. And I use circa 1850 stripper for the most part. Now there are a lot of different strippers out there, different strengths. Um, there's professional grade and consumer grade. Circa 1850 is one of the best consumer grade strippers that I've found. It doesn't contain methylene chloride, which is good, but it doesn't mean that it's not toxic. So you want to make sure that you're working in a well-ventilated area if you're using it and wear a respirator. I personally like it because it is very effective and fast, and I'm actually going to show you just how fast in a few moments. The kitties are not allowed out here while I actively have stripper on the pieces, obviously because of the smell. And this little boy here has my whole heart entirely and we actually just got some potentially not great news on a routine checkup. They actually found a heart murmur and we're at the moment undergoing more testing to try to find out if it's related to heart disease or if he's one of the lucky ones that will just have it his whole life and not be affected. So send us all your positive vibes and good wishes where that's concerned. Okay, I want to show you how long it takes me to apply the stripper for it to work and for me to scrape it off on this one side. I already have the top and the other side completely stripped and sanded down. I just flipped it over so that I could access this a little bit better. I often see posts with certain strippers having to be kept on for hours at a time or even overnight, sometimes with saran wrap. And I just want to show you that there is an alternative depending on what you're willing to work with. I had this piece applied, activated, stripped off in just over four minutes. So I totally understand if you're working like in your home and you don't want to have a chemical stripper in your house, that totally makes sense. But if you do have a work room or you work outside, having a good stripper really does make a big difference in how long it takes you to do pieces. So from back where you are sitting, you may not be able to see some of the little white specks in the wood grain. There's a big one there obviously on the bottom that I'm going to chip out and put some wood filler in. But there's also a lot of really tiny specks here and there and I'm going to have to deal with that a little bit later on. Some of these larger ones I'm actually going to try to poke out before I put the sealer on this piece, um, but some are just too small and if I were to go in with this tool I would actually just take too much of the wood out, I would gouge too much out, so I'll use some markers for that in a bit. This rail was actually completely out of its spot so I just added some wood glue and used a hammer to pound the staple back in, clamped it up and let that dry. If you are scraping paint off a piece, a drawer face specifically, you need to know for sure which way the wood grain is running. <laughs> I was lucky enough that there was a little piece here so I could see that it was actually running vertically, so up and down the face, not left to right. If I had taken the scraper and tried to go left to right, I would have scratched the heck out of this and probably damaged it. You always want to look if you can, at the grain on the face before you start scraping it. And don't go based on what you see on the side. 
because the edge banding doesn't always run in the same direction as the wood on the face. This might actually surprise some people. These are what a lot of people would think are solid wood, but they're not. There's several layers here. We've got this main section that is solid wood, but it's not one piece. There's actually three separate pieces. Then we have a substrate on top of that, which is a thin layer of usually veneer. And if I just scrape this away, you can see the very, very, very thin piece of walnut veneer on top of that. And same thing on the bottom, you've got a substrate veneer here and another piece of veneer on the back side. It's important to know these things when you go to remove it like this because if you're not paying attention, you could put your little pry bar down in between the layers of veneer and just completely mess it up. Also taking care to push the pressure away from the drawer face and into the handle itself. If I were to try to pry the other way, I would actually gouge into the veneer on the drawer face. These are normally held on by pins and a little bit of glue. Sometimes you end up with a lot of glue and you need something like a heat gun to try to loosen the glue first. But I know from having worked on its matching piece a while back that these are pins with a small bit of glue. And I'm just going to number these to make my life a little bit easier when it comes time to putting them back on. I also don't want to pull too hard with the pry bar because I could quite easily snap this piece of wood in half, which would also not be good. If you are watching this right now thinking, oh my gosh, this is taking forever to get to the good stuff, and by good stuff I usually mean the stain or clear coat, um, you're totally right. <laughs> this did take a while. It was a labor of love for sure. Now I know what you're thinking. You're looking at this thinking, oh my gosh, this came off so easily. Why didn't you just use stripper on the rest of it instead of scraping? The reason is this isn't walnut with its big open pores. This is ash and the paint just doesn't absorb into it quite the same way. You can see a little bit there how it turned milky. And if I had done that on the walnut, I would have had little white flecks everywhere, <laughs> even more so than I already do. So that's why I opted to save the stripper on the paint just for the legs because I knew this wood could handle it. Inside the drawers have already been cleaned out with cleaner, but they're still pretty dingy looking and they've got some staining and marks. So I'm opting to sort of scuff sand what needs to be sanded and then I'm going to reseal it. And I'm also going to, even though it's torn, re-glue the part of this maker's sticker that is still there. I don't really use this wipe on poly very much anymore, but for an application like this, it's absolutely perfect. It's going to help the sanded parts blend in with what I didn't have to sand and it's very easy to apply. 
I'm using a specialty scraper kit here to get into the grooves of these handle pieces. I'm using the flat scraper for the rounded part and then that little specialty one in the grooves. These kits are great and I will link to them below. If you do any amount of scraping at all, these will definitely come in handy for you. Okay, so the time has come. My sanding is now complete. It is time to work on the cabinet here. As I mentioned, the insides of these pieces are veneer, but what's interesting is that on one side it is this quarter sawn oak veneer, and on the other side it's walnut, which kind of makes it a little tricky with how I have to stain this. And I'm opting to use General Finish's gel stain in the color nutmeg for this. So this is the other side. You can see there is walnut veneer there. The walnut veneer on this inner panel is going to match the walnut veneer on the outside, so I need to tape it off because that's just getting a clear coat. But on this side with that oak veneer, I have to stain it to more closely match this walnut color. And same with the ash on the rails here. This should come as no surprise to anyone familiar with my channel. I do love to use Odie's oil, especially on woods like walnut and teak. I want to show you what this looks like when you get a brand new jar. So when you first get it, it's going to be kind of the consistency of almost solid state honey. You can see it's quite thick. What you want to do is stir it up until it becomes more like liquid honey and then you'll know you're ready. This is an important thing to do because you want to make sure that all of the ingredients are mixed well. And I like to apply my Odie's oil with these Merkin Milan pads. There's different types of non-woven pads that you can use. Sometimes they're white. I prefer this one. It works well. This is not a product you want to put on with a rag or a brush. Odie's oil generally doesn't darken the wood. It will help bring out whatever the natural color is. And walnut in particular is a tricky one because often you'll have someone that sands it down and says, oh my gosh, I love this natural color. I'll just apply a clear coat and keep it this nice light color. And then they put a clear coat on and as you can see, it turns very dark like this. But on the ash, you notice it stayed light, which is the natural color and that's what it does. There are certain finishes like some polyurethanes and certain Danish oils that are tinted that will change the color of the wood. But Odie's generally just brings out the natural color of the wood, which like I said, in walnut like this is a darker color. So remember that I said that there would be a few white flecks to deal with later on. You can see them here. I just want to take a moment to say thank you so much for watching and commenting and liking and sharing these videos. It really helps my channel out a lot and on a platform with so many options, I'm always honored to have you here with me. It's really important when you're applying Odie's oil that after you get it all on, you let it sit for a little bit and then you come in and you wipe it all off. And actually, I have now finished putting my Odie's oil on and you can see how very little I've used on this entire piece. 
So you can see as I'm pulling my fingers across here, this has been sitting overnight. Now normally you'd only let it sit for maybe a couple hours at the most. I left this on overnight because this is something I hear a lot of beginners struggle with. They'll come back and they'll say, well, I tried it and my finish was really cloudy. It's not supposed to be cloudy. Or they'll say my finish is very dull looking or it was very difficult to get it off. And if I were to just go in with my rag and immediately try to wipe this off after it's sitting all night, it would be very difficult. So all you have to do is go in, add a little bit more odors oil. It will reactivate what is left on the surface and then you can more easily wipe it off. And you can see now when I run my fingers, there's no trace of the oil. If you can pull your fingers along and see a trail where your fingers were, you didn't rub enough of the oil off. It is imperative that you get all of the excess oil off. And you can see too what a difference it makes in the sheen. Can you see on the front of the drawers there how dull it looks? Once I go in and wipe that off, you get this really nice low luster and you can control the sheen of Odie's oil based on how much you sand. So the higher the grit that you sand to, the more sheen you're gonna have. And it's not like film finishes where you can only sand to a certain point and then the finish won't adhere. You can apply Odie's to very, very highly sanded grits. And it's because it actually molecularly bonds to the wood fibers rather than settling into the scratch patterns like a normal film finish. I'm nearing the end now, so exciting. Look at that wood grain. But I do have a problem. I do still have some white flecks in certain areas that were too small to be scraped out. So all I'm doing, the Odie's has now settled and cured. I'm just taking these markers and going in very lightly to try to camouflage as much as I can. I'll never get every single one. There's probably literally thousands. <laughs> but I'm trying to do as much as I can. I also need to reattach these plastic guides and normally what I'll do is I will use the middle hole to line it up to where it was before and then I will move that middle hole because the chances of it coming out again are quite high. So I just try to reseat at least one or two of the holes into fresh wood. This is a little off topic, but you guys know how much I love having Nacho in my videos and I call him my little businessman because he's always in everyone's business. Well, Nacho El Diablo Hernandez now has his own <laughs> nameplate on my desk and look how proud the little man is. This is the best thing ever and this was the highlight of my day, so I'm sharing it with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for following along as I did my absolute best to save this mid-century-esque walnut and ash chest of drawers from this layer of very light gray latex paint. Enjoy the reveal and I will see you next time.